Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and my co-host is Wendy Perry, as you see, and we have a special guest with us today. His name is Jeffrey Deskovic. And uh, he has an interesting story. He is someone who was wrongfully convicted uh, of um, a, a horrible crime, spent several years in prison, got exonerated, and now he's uh, an advocate. In fact, he's risen in the ranks to become an attorney. And that's how I met him. The reason he's in my window is because he's actually in my hometown uh, speaking at Florida Southern College. So. Uh, Welcome, welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you, thanks for having me. All right, Wendy, Wendy, uh, would you like to <laughs> yeah. contribute? I don't well, see you moving. <laughs> that's right, I just wanna, uh, once again this week, um, just to let our viewers know, my, my mouth does move when I speak, but I'm still recovering from my um, retina reattachment surgery, and I'm just not quite ready for people to see my eye yet, um, so I, could either wear my eye patch or I could put my picture up. So I, I went with my picture today, but I'm really excited. I'm, I'm really excited to have Jeffrey on the show today because his story is, it, it's, it's dramatic. I mean, it really is. And, and here he is sitting next to you to talk about what he went through, which is really very, very serious, um, extreme situation. And now he's come through it and he's helping other people, which is, amazing as well so thank so, you for being on uh, custody matters live jeffrey uh thanks for having me on so jeffrey tell us a little bit of story when this all started how your life made an amazing like a, a terrible turn but also you ended up taking another turn <coughs> right so the year was uh 1990 i was in peak I lived in peak skill uh westchester county new york so think suburbs my classmate was found uh murdered and raped, and uh, ultimately the police, they focused in on me, and uh, some of the students told them that I, they might want to talk to me. That's how they focused in on me. I didn't quite fit in. Uh, I was kind of, I was a sensitive, uh, sentimental person, and the police interpreted that as, like I, as me feeling sorry for what I had done, so that was another factor, and then they got a psychological profile from the NYPD, what they thought that the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator would be like. And when I matched that, it kind of was a reinforcing factor. So ultimately the police uh, uh, coerced the false confession out of me over the course of seven hours, uh, featuring threats and false promises and other third degree tactics. Uh, in a nutshell, and we'll expand this out as you ladies wish with your questions or not, your story, your choice. Uh, but I was uh, ultimately wrongfully convicted of a murder and rape. Uh, despite a DNA test, I was exonerated through further testing, which um, identified the actual perpetrator who was arrested and convicted. Uh, the uh, wrongful conviction was caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, a uh, terrible public defender. Wow, I can't even imagine. And how and how many years were you in prison? Uh, Sixteen. And you said that you were also in a maximum security prison. Yes, I was charged as an adult, and so I was given uh, an adult sentence of fifteen to life, and I was incarcerated in a maximum security prison because that's what they said people who've been charged as adults. So how is it that you went from? Uh, <laughs> from being in a maximum security prison with no hope for your future to now becoming an attorney, exonerated and an attorney, and now being an advocate for, for people? So I, I lost seven appeals. I got turned down for parole. Ultimately, I was exonerated through further DNA testing via the data bank, which identified the actual perpetrator, who, by the way, uh, killed a second victim uh, three and a half years later, who, was a school teacher who had two children. So my charges were dismissed on actual innocence grounds. He was charged and convicted. And I kind of found purpose in what happened to me. I believe I'm in the world to fight wrongful conviction. And so uh, for about five years, I was an individual advocate from speaking to writing articles to doing media interviews, meeting with elected officials, uh, was eventually compensated. And then I started the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which has freed seven people in six years. And we've helped pass six laws aimed at uh, preventing wrongful conviction. But along the way, I, uh, I um, 
combine my experience in informal learning and my advocacy with formal education. So I got a bachelor's degree from Mercy College, which gave me the scholarship. I have a master's degree from John Jay College with a thesis on wrongful conviction cause and reforms. And I recently graduated law school, the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University. I'm waiting for the results of the bar exam, but I believe that my place in the world is to fight wrongful conviction. So I do this, uh, I do this work and I want to be able to directly exonerate people as a lawyer. That's the dream. That's why I went through this difficulty of law school. So did you go, did you go to school after you got out of prison or? Okay. So I got the GED while I was in prison because I was arrested while I was in high school. Uh, I did get an associate's while I was incarcerated and then another year of school and towards the bachelor's, but then the funding was cut. So when I was released, Mercy College gave me a scholarship to finish the last 10 classes. And then the other studies happened after that. So that, that portion of it was after I was free. Wow, oh my goodness. I can't imagine, I can't imagine going through that many years and, and just not, just not, I guess ha still having hope, still having hope that, that you're gonna, that justice will, prevail and that you're going to be exonerated and I mean what kept you kept you hanging in there yeah so a number of factors uh, belief in God was one of them another thing was that I thought I was just doing a year or two for the next appeal which I was sure I was going to win because I was innocent I believe in the system worked uh, another thing is that I used to go to the law library and learn the law so that gave uh, a sense of comfort I used to collect articles about other people who were exonerated, so that was desperation to keep going. Um, I felt like I didn't have the luxury of just giving into thoughts of um, uh, suicide or uh, just losing my mind because I knew no one was coming to my rescue, so I was going to have to keep it together to try to recruit somebody to help me to get the legal help that I needed. So that was another factor um, uh, from playing sports to other things that just, I found, I found like a little routine while I was in prison. So all those things were true at the same time. Wow. I wondered the same thing, just about your um, emotional resilience and tenacity and how you seem so positive now. And, and I, I don't know that you were positive for 16 years. It's such an incredibly long time, but also what about your family? What about your parents and and maybe grandparents and, and your family members, how did they get through all of those years? Uh, my grandmother used to visit with me when my mother would come, but she uh, wound up passing away in 1996. Uh, so she never learned that I was exonerated. Uh, my brother was impacted by my wrongful imprisonment. So he, the kids on the school bus and the school used to uh, say nasty things to him and they would try to hit him. So. He dropped out of school. He's never went back, so it impacted him that way. Uh, my mother um, uh, said that it was very difficult, uh, the visiting process, because when she was time to go home, she went home, and she knew she was leaving me behind, so she said it was difficult for her in that aspect of it. Wow. Oh, my goodness. You know, it just, it, it occurs to me as you're telling your story that it just affects so many people um, when there is a wrongful conviction, obviously you very directly in a really severe way, but everyone in your family. And then even to hear that the, the actual perpetrator went on to, to murder someone else, you know, a young mom, a teacher. It's just when you think about how these wrongful convictions really uh, branch out and, and cause so much destruction to so many lives, it, it's really a tragedy. I, I agree, in, in a larger sense, uh, wrongful convictions of public safety issue. Sure. You know, something I wanted to shift because, you know, since we're about custody matters and, and our viewership are usually are mostly parents, grandparents, um, or friends of people who've, uh, whose a parent doesn't have a relationship with the children. And that there's a, might be a, battle going on between the two parents in court and i know in wendy's case in my case we there have been times when we have been alienated from our our own children because of custody battles and um and it just seems like sometimes the court adds to the problem you know you have a judge that's not not willing to really stick their neck out to to make a, a decision for the parents or they end up marginalizing a parent um just a 
to end it all. So, um, what do you, what's your take on how the court system is, and if, if it, you know, what needs to be done? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely think that the justice system is uh, definitely broken. Uh, the overlap in terms of the alienation. You know, I mean, the Department of Corrections are in the habit of incarcerating people who are from the city, put them in the facilities that are like further away, and the people who are from upstate, you know, are housed in the prisons that are closer to the city. So it, it poses a significant obstacle when it comes to visitation. So there is alienation that way. Um, but, you know, it was a awkward experience that I would meet up with my extended family after I was exonerated because uh, many of them had never come to see me. Uh, it certainly put a strain on things in terms of my relationship with my mother and my brother. So there were there, were, there was those aspects of it, and it, it just seemed so maddening that these judges, nobody, despite all these clear warning signs, that nobody ever did anything to halt what was happening uh, to me. Why do you think that the judges don't, uh, or at least my, my view of it, it seems like the ju judges are not willing to expedite a decision, and it seems like it drags on and on and on. Right, so there's, uh, tension in the justice system between competing concepts. So on one hand, there's what they call finality of conviction. You know, in other words, you, you had your day in court and you lost and how long are we going to keep doing this? So there's the battle between that and accuracy. And it seems like there's this uh, disturbing obsession over proceduralism versus substance of justice. So I lost in federal court. It's an example of that because my paperwork was filed four days late. The courts thought that was more important, not the issue, not my raising my innocence supported by the DNA. So those are, I think there's an unwillingness of retrying cases, the amount of time that, and, and financial resources that goes into that. So I think that those are, those are issues as well. I think that they get jaded and certainly having a really not enough financial resources and a large caseload, all those things are factors. I mean, I know it's so easy for people, the go-to is to blame it on the greed of the attorneys. Um, and yet I, I think, you know what, if I, um, I'm the client and if my demands are unreasonable, you know, I mean, it, the attorney is just doing what the client uh, wishes for them to do. So I can't necessarily, uh, my shift is more on blaming the process of the courts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that like in my case, it was said that it was like a perfect storm. So a lot of different aspects of the system were at fault. I mean, the courts were one thing, uh, the prosecutor engaging in misconduct and not wanting to admit the errors and other. But then on top of that, you know, my, my lawyer compounded things. He never investigated my alibi or presented that, uh, not presented that evidence. He never really allowed me to involve other adults in some of the strategic decisions. So uh, I didn't understand the implications of taking the stand or not taking the stand or having a jury trial or a bench trial. But you know, certainly bad lawyering is definitely a factor in a lot of these, uh, a lot of the cases. Uh, it's common that public defenders have way too large of a caseload. It's not unusual for them to represent 100 people at the same time. It's not an even financial playing field between public defender's office and the prosecutor's uh, office does not equal pay for both sides. So I think all these institutional deficiencies and inequities lead to the injustice. I agree. Jeffrey, um, tell us about your foundation, the Deskovic Foundation. What does your foundation do and how can people learn more about it and get involved with your organization? Yeah, so, yeah, so the organization is the Full title is the Jeffrey Duskovic Foundation for Justice, and we have we free people who are wrongfully in prison. We also pursue uh, policy changes aimed at preventing that from happening in the first place. Uh, so we have been able to free seven people in six years, and we have been able to change uh, three laws. I've been working a coalition group the foundation is part of, which I'm an advisory board member of. Uh, Call it happened to you. We were able to um, pass uh, like an independent oversight board for the prosecutors and. Uh, we improve the information sharing process between the prosecutors and, and the defense. And in terms of how people can find out more uh, about the organization, uh, the website is uh, pretty user friendly. Uh, it's uh, www.deskovic.org. Uh, so we do have a number of ways people 
can be involved with a crowdfunding site. So I need people to help them to post it and spread word about it on social media and word of mouth and you know, other um, other ways of uh, other ways of communicating that. But attending events and and uh, calling elected officials. When, you know, there's always legislation that's we're trying to get passed. Uh, but really, maybe your business organizations throughout the country are doing that, and I think that we have not enough citizens who are contacting their elected officials to express support about the measures. So that's definitely a way people can get involved. And listen, if political candidates can raise double digit and sometimes triple digit millions or various campaigns, I don't, you know, largely on large dollars, small dollar donations, I don't, I don't see why people don't support innocence work. I mean, it's not free to do it. To do the work, and so we need people to um, contribute. Yeah, if a lot of people contributed a small amount, we can get a lot done. I agree. Yeah, I did. I did want to point that out. That I'm sure that the work that you do is, um, you know, it takes a lot of funding because I'm I'm guessing that when someone contacts you, you do a lot of really diligent research before yeah, you make a determination. You know, if if they are innocent and wrongfully convicted. Um, yeah, there's so a lot your, of the, your organiz the, It is a 501c3, is what I wanted to say, so people know that it is yes, a, a, a nonprofit. Yes, it is, and there is a lot of diligence that goes into assessing innocence claims, but also the viability. Also, I mean, you, you have you have to identify a potential route to victory, and if you can't, then you have to pass in that case. I understand. So, so today you're at Florida Southern College. You're yes. speaking tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, what group of people are you speaking to? Yeah, there's students here at, uh, at, Flor at Florida Southern College, so it's supposed to be a big turnout. Earlier today, I, was, uh, I spoke in a few classrooms on other topics, so I spoke in a communications class, and I discussed the intersection of wrongful conviction and the media. Uh, I just came from a law and psychology class where I focused in on um, uh, exonerated reintegration, personal difficulties, milestones that I had, but then also the, the topic uh, in, in general and different ways people can uh, get involved, what type of careers they could be, they could embark upon. Uh, tonight will be the full story. Uh, so I will cover arrest and conviction, time in prison, appeals and exoneration, reintegration, wrongful conviction causes and reforms, uh, my, my foundation, and it will be like a move to action component. Awesome, awesome. And you are, you're going to several colleges and universities, aren't you? Yeah, I was, uh, yesterday I was at, I was at uh, Stetson Law School. So I, I spoke over there, and uh, here I'm, I'm at Florida Southern College, but I'm in talks with other entities. I, I think I'm going to make another uh, tour of Florida probably in March. You know, So I mean, I like to have a message, and I like to take it on the road. So if you're watching this and you know of an educational institution or um, community organization, I mean, it usually starts out that somebody just suggests an idea, and then they reach out to me, and you know, it all comes together, and then I'm on my way. You know, uh, it, that is in our viewers, because they're dealing with mostly a lot of wrongful accusations of domestic violence and and thing, things like that, that actually tear up their families. They, yes. they end up not having even access to a child because of false allegations. Right. It, it can really destroy a family, may not put them in prison, but... Um, you know, I know for us to have lost a child through a court battle and, and everything, it, it does feel like a death. Yeah, I do know people that have experienced that. They do describe it the way that you're describing. Uh, I want to mention that there's another crossover into awful convictions. So like a lot of um, mothers or even uh, babysitters, I mean, uh, they, a lot of them have been wrongfully convicted in shaken baby cases, you know, which is kind of a default diagnosis of somebody, a child suddenly dies and they can't identify any other reason for that, then, they, then the diagnosis becomes, well, the baby must have been shook. And who do you point the finger at? Well, it's the person who was last, it's the person who was last with, it's the person, it's the person who was last with uh, the baby. So a lot of women are wrongfully convicted in, in those kinds of cases. Yeah, I definitely. Um, and sometimes, in the course of that, the domestic cases and child custody and parental alienation. Sometimes that that's led people to uh, led people to be in jail. Maybe not to go to prison, but to have a stint in, in jail. I mean, sometimes uh, false allegations are resorted to as a means of gaining uh, child custody. And of course, there are times when uh, the 
non-custodial parent just out of desperation, you know, does something uh, silly, you know, they, they break the law and they take their child and next thing they know they're, they're uh, incarcerated themselves. I, yeah, that, that's happened actually several times this year. There have been deaths from child exchanges that have happened at police stations where there's just a parent just has had enough. And there's, I mean, there's been other different scenarios, but basically it's just the, it's escalated to such a bad situation that it, it just violence ensues. And, um, and, you know, seems like all you have to do is to make allegations of domestic violence, get the person arrested, and then boom, you you become the primary caregiver by default. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly the point. You know, I want to mention just another crossover between wrongful conviction and, you know, what we're talking about children and parents, uh, which is that uh, sometimes in the false confession cases, which, uh, by the way, just a uh, context of uh, false confessions are in the cause of wrongful conviction, 25% of the DNA proven wrongful convictions, uh, particularly vulnerable populations, are youth and people with mental health issues. But a crossover into the parental element of that is that in some of the cases, the police co opt the parents. So they turn the parents into an agent of coercion for the police. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on, Jimmy, just tell them what happened. They know that you did it, let's just tell them and let's just be out of here and be done with this. And it's, you know, they're under an illusion themselves and they engage in coercion themselves as a, as a parent. And next thing they know, the, the child is uh, is wrongfully imprisoned and, you know, it'll be a long time coming before, they, uh, uh, before, before they're before free. I mean, if you look at making a murderer, for example, I mean, Brendan Dassey, I mean, he was a youth and he had mental health issues. So he had both of those working against him and his own investigator coerced them into a confession. It wasn't simply just the, the police. Uh, as a kind of a case in point. Wow, you know, Jeffrey, you know, Jeffrey, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you. It, it just amazes me your how positive you are and your your strength and, and, like I said, your resilience. What what advice would you have for our viewers who are going through any situation for a long period of time where they might feel hopeless? What what advice would you have for them to to stay strong and not give up hope? Yeah, so, uh, and I use this myself, like during the, the difficult time when I was in prison and even uh, during difficult time periods in law school where I was sure I was going to fail everything. Uh, so I used to think, you know, maybe I'm, maybe this is a key moment right now. I think I could be on the precipice of breaking through, of attaining my goal. But if I quit right now, maybe I would have gotten there, except that I quit. So I can't quit. I got to keep going. So that would be that would be a piece of advice that I would uh, that, that I would uh, give that I would give to the viewers. Wow, that takes so much. I mean, so much courage to to hang in there, you know, knowing that you're innocent and just it's like you had. It seems to me like you had no choice. No, you're exactly right. I didn't have a choice. But another key, as I think about it now, uh, is remember to separate goals from steps okay uh, the route that you have in mind you might hit a wall but that be, just means that you look for a different route look for a different way it's not how you get there it's the important thing is what the goal is and so like, I, I tried a lot of different routes and so i think translating that just to, to the generic you know, if you have to switch up tactics i mean then you switch up tactics i mean look for another route to to get to your goal but the main thing is not to not is not to quit and to and to uh, not be afraid to keep working really really hard wow i love that that is awesome look for a different route and i guess every day tell yourself i'm one day closer one day closer every day right and and, and you know just reflecting back on my life journey uh post being post exoneration after I was released uh, in a lot of different situations, the, the right person showed up at the right time to help me with one narrow particular thing to get me from one point in my life to the next. And then they, they you know, disappeared back into their, their life. You know, they weren't meant to be someone traveled with me the whole life. But I think that if you have the goals and you're switching routes and you're working really hard, I, I think, you know, and looking for other ways of doing things, I think that the right 
person can show up at the right time to help you in, a, in, in, in just the, that, that right way. And so you have to be flexible enough to, to go through that side door. You know, Wendy, that just gives me chills when you talked about that, because I think about it's like divine synchronicity, people showing up just at the, the appointed time. You know, for me, for me, that point in time, so when I, you know, was struggling to have uh, income, you know, it just happened to be that a, uh, a county, a weekly independent paper had just been started a month and a half ago. And the, the person who was uh, the founder of the paper, they interviewed me as a subject matter, but then he extended me an offer, and so that did help me have some money come through. And then, you know, I, I, the right person showed up in terms of my furthering my education. So it was the dean of uh, Mercy College who lined up a scholarship and asked me, do you, do you want to go to, do you want to finish your degree? You know, so I mean, those are a couple of examples. Another person helped me when it came to uh, computer uh, computer literacy. Another person uh, helped me get into law school. So I mean, those are all. Just, and even the school that Mercy College, which gave me the scholarship, they allowed me to stay on campus, which is what prevented me from having to go to a home shelter. And then when I finished uh, Human Development Services of Westchester, I happened to learn about them at the right point in time, and I happened to fit their criteria of, of people that they helped with uh, housing. So all those were steps and people that helped uh, helped along the way. So wow, Def definitely. I, I, I think it's I think it's also a little amazing as you're telling this. I think it's a little amazing that you that you trusted people. You continued to trust these people that crossed your path. And was that ever hard for you to do because of the situation that you had been in, trusting people? Well, when it happened, though, I, I was it was I wasn't really looking at it like do I trust the person or not. It, my mind frame was that I don't know what the heck else to do. I'm out of my own ideas, and so what else is there to try other than what someone is suggesting? I mean, just to build on that synchronistic uh, theme for a half second more. You know, I the investigator that helped me connect with the Innocence Project who took my case. I, I wrote a letter to a book author and carried a publishing company. It was supposed to go to a warden of a prison and someone there sent the investigator instead and so she helped connect me there. Then at the Innocence Project itself, one of the non-lawyers there uh, represented my case uh, three times to the lawyers because they didn't want to take the case there. So other examples of the right people at the right time. Mm. Well, you know what? It's time. <laughs> oh my goodness! Just when we're getting it, getting it been good. Um, wow! I'm so glad and honored to meet you. Thank you very much. It's so nice to be able to meet somebody who's not letting life beat them down. That's using um, a situation as an access to a calling that makes a, makes life better for other people. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on your show. It's, uh, you know, I, through the media and through new media, I mean, that's how I reach many more people than I ever could in person. So I'm always grateful for opportunities to go on other people's platforms and to you know, share my story and the work that I'm doing. And, you know, it's still eliminate the different ways the justice system is uh, broken because, I mean, the public educational aspect of it is what kind of tells the soil for systemic change to eventually happen. So that's the point of doing all of this. Awesome. Well, thank Maybe. you for all you do, and, and thank you for sharing your story because it's it really an inspiration to anyone who hears it. You know, not just people who are affected by the issue of, of wrongful convictions. Really, anybody um, can can you know feel inspired and motivated by your story. So, thank you so much for for sharing that. Sure, absolutely. You know, maybe just a last thought, just, you know, I, building the supporting the point you just made, uh, you know, I, I've had people tell me, you know, like I was feeling kind of, you know, down, this happened, I lost my job or this or that, but then I stopped and thought about your story. And it kind of put everything in perspective for me and allows me to, you know, refocus and keep going. So yes, it can impact positively people above and beyond just literally in the wrongful conviction situations that it inspires me that I can have an impact on, on people just across genres of life experience and difficulties and challenges and walks of life. Okay, Wendy, but do you what do you always say? 
<laughs> parental alienation can happen to anyone, so it should matter to everyone. Which is very similar to what you said, which was? It can happen to you. That's right. Thank you for joining us at Custody Matters Live. Uh, stay tuned next week for another amazing interview. Bye-bye.